Good afternoon, everyone. And I am delighted first to be part of this, to share the podium with Richard Wallace, Mike Eisman, all of you, and Don Peterson, who is one of the founders and the discoverers of the unique characteristics of this disease, and to be able to talk a little bit about the mycobacteria. I am a mycobacteriologist. I think about the microorganism and how it survives in the world and how it ends up infecting people. So that's gonna be what I'm gonna talk about. Now, what do we do in my lab? And, and I thought this was useful because it sort of helped, it really does help focus my efforts. We identify sources of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. We identify the factors that influence non-tuberculous mycobacteria in habitats shared with humans. One of the phrases that I came up with that resonates particularly with me and a number of others is that you and I, humans, are surrounded by mycobacteria. What kind of actions can we take to reduce human exposure to NTN? What sorts of things may work? And we'll t I'll talk a little bit about those. And then we can also test the efficacy of those suggestions. Now, what do I mean by actually both of these two points? The first is that we make observations that tell us that in certain habitats there are NTM and in others there are not. For example, in a study funded by the NTM Foundation, we discovered that people who had hot water temperatures above 130 degrees Fahrenheit very seldom had NTM in their household water. By contrast, if you had a lower hot water heater temperature, about 125 degrees, was much more likely that you had NTM. Now that then suggested even to a dim bulb like myself, well, let's raise the hot water heater temperature. But I want you to understand, we've never tested that. We're going to be testing that now. We're going to raise the hot water heater temperature of homes that have NTM that we've identified with Leah Landy and Rebecca and Richard and everybody collaborating. We know what houses within literally a, what, 10 kilometer range around the medical center here, and we'll see if the mycobacteria disappear. So we can talk all we want about possible things, but we're gonna to move to actually testing them and seeing if they really do work. Now, as I said, you and I are surrounded by NTM. NTM are in soil particularly peat-rich soils. There are million per gram. This actually harkens back to the founder of mycobacterial ecology, Gendra Kazda, a, a German, uh, actually Czech, working in Germany, a uh, microbiologist who first started thinking about where mycobacteria came from. It was reinforced that they're in peat-rich soils in looking at Finland. Finland is a pine-forested, peat-boggy place. And one evening at a meeting that I'd been invited to, we did what the Finns do every evening, and that's go to the sauna. And in the sauna are a bunch of hot rocks and a bucket. And you take the scooper from the bucket, not spilling your beer, which was in the same <laughs> sauna, and dip the water out and pour it over the hot rocks and you make this wonderful steam. Well, I'm again not that stupid, so I didn't miss the fact that you were making a real big aerosol. And so I got a bottle and filled it with water in the bucket and it had about 10 million mAvium per milliliter. It's about a two gallon, so you can work out the numbers, but it had billions and billions of mycobacteria. 
every HIV-infected patient in Finland had M. avium infection. This was before the highly active antiretroviral therapy we have now, which was unusually high amongst HIV-infected patients. It was because the load of M. avium in Finland and other northern European and piney forest regions here in the United States, why there's, there are so many people infected with M. avium AIDS patients in that area because they have very high numbers in their environment. And of course, it drains right into the water. With Aunt Mary Ann de Groot, who hooked, Mike Eisman hooked me up with this talented young infectious disease fellow at National Jewish, Mike called me one day and said, you ought to talk to this girl. She's really bright. She had some good ideas. We figured out that a number of her patients had mycobacterial disease, and they were also gardeners. This was the same time that we had discovered some things about Finland. So we got soil samples from the patients, their soil samples that they had potted, that they had handled, and we found lots of mycobacteria in them and the mycobacteria had the same DNA fingerprint as the isolates we got from their lungs. So we know one source, potting soil. We know that NTM are natural inhabitants of water. I put natural in here on purpose because many of the organisms that we have in drinking water are called contaminants. In the United States and elsewhere in the world, we survey and test water for the presence of E. coli, which is of human and animal origin. And if water has E. coli, Escherichia coli, it is presumed to have been contaminated with fecal material. E. coli is not the only organism we're worried about, but it's a surrogate for the presence of other more dangerous fecal organisms that cause diarrheal and gastrointestinal disease. When E. coli enters a river, it has a certain number, and as it stays in the river or flows downstream from the point source where it was polluting, the numbers fall because the organism does not like that habitat and dies off. Our mycobacteria don't do that. There are low numbers in natural waters. They get into a drinking water system. Other organisms are killed off with chlorine. The mycobacteria are resistant to chlorine. And they grow in between the treatment plant and your household water. And we know they, it's very likely that we've, it's been shown in buildings that they grow in the buildings as well. So although we have created conditions to discourage and kill gastrointestinal pathogens, like E. coli and others, and enteric viruses, we have unwittingly created conditions for mycobacterium avium and the other non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Now, I don't mean to point any finger at the water industry at all because they are doing the very best job in protecting us from gastrointestinal disease. However, at the same time, something else has happened. It's an unintended consequence of probably the best thing we can do. So we have to work at that interface between doing something and creating perhaps another problem. Now, we started off by looking for mycobacteria in drinking water, just water samples, natural water samples and water samples we got out of pipes and things like that. But that's not where the mycobacteria are. Mycobacteria are waxy bacteria. They have an outer membrane that's filled with lipids. 40% of the weight of mycobacterial cells is literally lipid very long chain lipid. It surrounds the cells, makes them very impermeable. They unfortunately, because of the impermeability, grow slowly because it's hard for them to get the nutrients transported through that 
impermeable barrier, but it also makes them resistant to chlorine, it makes them resistant to heavy metals, it makes them resistant to antibiotics, all right? It also leads to their preferential attachment to surfaces. So mycobacteria are not floating around in the water. There are a few because they've come off or sloughed off that, what we call biofilm, the growth of microorganisms on the inside of pipes. That's where the big numbers are. Something in most pipe systems other than one with copper pipes, which harbor the lowest numbers, something on the order of between 1,000 and 15,000 per square centimeter. Now, square centimeter is smaller than a stamp, and if you think of a water distribution system, Los Angeles County, for example, I think has 5,000 miles of pipes. If you consider, and this is a nice exercise for undergraduate students to remind them of things that they've forgotten about in elementary school, you say, how many square centimeters are on the pipes in the LA County water system? It's a very big number, I can assure you. And if you multiply that by 1,000 to 20,000, the range that we find of mycobacterial cells per centimeter squared, you come up with a huge, very high number. You can do the same number calculation in your home as well. So they're not floating around, but they're in that biofilm. When you first turn on the shower, you may dislodge a lot of them from the biofilm. So don't go in the shower, turn on the, get the jet of water and fill the place up with an aerosol because it probably has lots of mycobacteria. Run it maybe slowly, but I have some other hints later on of what things we can do.